is Fernando Codá from IMPA, and he's going to talk about rigidity of min-max minimal spheres in three manifolds. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me thank, first of all, Cathy Tenenblatt for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to, to talk here in the geometry session. Um, so the title of the talk is Rigidity of Min-Max Minimal Spheres in Three Manifolds. Before I start, let me mention that this is joint work with Professor Andre Neves from Imperial College. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a sort of a well-known fact that if you have uh, lower bounds on the scalar curvature of a three-manifold, you can get some information on the space of minimal surfaces. So uh, one can say things about the topology of, for example, area-minimizing surfaces. We can prove rigidity theorems. But one common feature of all these results is that they all, uh, they all are about uh, area minimizing surfaces. So in this talk, I'm going to to discuss some some rigidity uh, results for for which the minimal surface involved is actually produced by min max methods. So that's one basic aspect of the of the talk. So uh, so let me start with some motivation. First, some notation. Uh, when I say rigidity here, everything is with respect to lower bounds on the scalar curvature, which will be denoted by R. So R is going to be the scalar curvature of a given manifold. And um, every surface here will be, when I say surface, in the stock, they will always be uh, embedded, uh, let's see, connected and orientable. Sorry, not, 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 not oriented. Compact, I mean. So all the surfaces involved will be embedded, connected, compact. OK, so the first result that, that I know that relates scalar coverture to the information minimal surfaces due to Shen and Yao. Um, Shen and Yao proved back in 79 uh, the following result. So they proved that if you have, suppose you have a three manifold, three dimensional Riemannian manifold, uh, let's say orientable, with non negative scalar curvature, and suppose that inside this manifold you have a surface, let's say the sigma is also orientable. And suppose the surface is minimal, so the mean curvature is zero, and also is stable, which means that the second variation of area is non-negative with respect to any direction. So sigma is a stable minimal surface. So they prove that sigma has to be diffeomorphic to either a sphere or a torus. And they also prove that if sigma is actually diffeomorphic to a torus, then it has to be totally geodesic. It's totally geodesic. So in some sense, in the generic case, uh, you have spheres. And if you, for some reason, find a torus, then you get some rigidity. That's sort of the uh, the idea about, about the theorem. And, uh, the proof is actually very simple. You just look at the stability inequality, which says that you have something like this. Uh, let's reach it. Greater than or equal to zero, right? You just plug in the, f the function phi equal to one, and you get the, the following inequality. Uh, you, you, you just use Gauss equation and Gauss Bonnet theorem, you get that the following estimate 
in terms of the oil characteristic of the surface, which comes from the gauss bonnet theorem. And it's very easy then to see that if the scalar curvature is non-negative, right, so the scalar curvature, so the other characteristic has to be non-negative. So it has to be either a sphere or a torus. And if it's zero, then the second fundamental form has to vanish. So the proof is very simple. But it was, was the first result in that direction. Uh, and they sort of conjectured uh, that if the surface is uh, locally area minimizing, for example, which is stronger than just being stable, then one should get some, some stronger rigidity. And that was actually proved by Kai and Galloway uh, in 2000. So they proved that if you assume that if sigma is a torus, right, so if sigma is a torus, and if sigma is actually locally area minimizing, so it means that the area of the surface is less than or equal to the area of any nearby surface, then you have actually your manifold should split locally, splits as a product of a torus times an interval. Let's say sigma here. What well, sigma is actually flat in that setting. So you actually get a strong rigidity, at least locally, if you, if you assume the area minimizing property. So, um, so that's an example of a rigidity statement, right? Relating scalar curvature and, and minimal surfaces. Uh, recently, uh, many people have looked at, you know, results of this sort. So one question is what can we say about one can see this as a, as a rigidity result for, for the, a torus cross an interval. So the, a natural question is, uh, can one prove rigidity results for a cylinder where the cross section is not a torus, but a sphere or a hyperbolic surface, for example? And it turns out that one, one can. So some, let me mention some similar results. Very recent. So there's a result of Let's see, Bray, Brando, and Nevis. So they prove a rigidity result of that type. The only difference is that the model is not a torus cross an interval, but the model is a sphere cross an interval. So, so it's a rigidity result where the cross section is a sphere. So here you have to assume since the scalar coverage of that guy is positive, you have to assume that the scalar coverage is bounded by, by two, for example. Right. And you can actually see that if the scalar coverage is bounded by two, then this inequality gives you a, a bound on the area of the surface. So you have a, a bound, a, a sharp bound for the area of the surface. And if, you, if, if that bound is achieved, then you get rigidity. That's the state. Uh, so the remaining case was the case where uh, the cross section was a hyperbolic surface of, of curvature minus one. So this is 2010. And the case where the cross section is a hyperbolic surface that was recently done by PhD students of mine. So that's Ivaldo Nunes. So he proved 2011 rigidity result of that sort where the surface is actually a surface of genus. So genus here is at least two. And here the scalar coverage is bounded by minus two, say. So the interesting thing about that uh, context is that because of the negative sign, the, the area estimate actually reverses. So you, you, you prove that the area is bounded from below by some sharp constant. And if you achieve uh, equality, then you get rigidity. OK, so as you can see, uh, these results are all about area minimizing um, Minimal surfaces. So, um, so another source of motivation for this talk comes from the uh, celebrated positive mass theorem, which was uh, proved proved first by Shen and Yao in '79 for dimensions less than or equal to seven. And later, there's a spinner proof due to Witten in 1981. Uh, for any dimension 
but requiring the topological assumption that the, that the manifold is a spin. So I'm not going to state the positive mass theorem, which is a very beautiful um, theorem connecting um, Riemannian geometry and general relativity. But let me just state a corollary of that. So one consequence of the positive mass theorem is a rigidity statement for the Euclidean space. So the rigidity, rigidity statement is the following. If you assume that you have a metric, uh, suppose you have a metric on Rn, G, such that outside a ball, the metric is actually Euclidean, and suppose that the scalar curvature of such a metric is non-negative, then the positive mass theorem tells you that because the metric is Euclidean outside the compact set, you, you prove that the mass, the so-called mass, is actually zero. And then the rigidity statement of the positive mass theorem tells you that the metric G is actually flat. So, this is a, uh, so it, it tells you that you cannot increase the scalar curvature of the Euclidean space by compactly supported deformations. So, uh, so this result inspired, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> inspired Minu to prove the same kind of result for the hyperbolic space. So he proved that the hyperbolic space, this was in 1988, he proved the rigidity, scalar curvature. rigidity of hyperbolic space. So the hyperbolic space, again, has this property that you cannot increase the scalar curvature of the hyperbolic space in a compact set. Right. And, he, uh, and he made a conjecture about the spherical setting, which was known as the Minus conjecture. So he conjectured that if you look at a, at a hemisphere of a sphere, right, bounded by the equator, so he conjectured the same thing, that it was impossible to, to increase the scalar curvature of the hemisphere by keeping the metric fixed near the equator. But it, uh, it turns out that this conjecture is false. So that follows from a theorem from a joint work with Brendel. So it's Brendel, myself, and, and Nevis. So we proved the following result that for any dimension greater than or equal to three, you, you can construct a metric, a smooth metric, on the hemisphere, so Sn plus is just the hemisphere. Right, so let's say Xn plus one and negative. So you can construct a metric G on the hemisphere such that the metric is actually coincides with the standard metric in the neighborhood of the equator, but the scalar curvature goes up inside. So, such that first uh, we know that the scalar curvature is at least the scalar curvature of the hemisphere. We also know that this is everywhere. Uh, is actually strictly bigger than the standard curvature somewhere. Uh, but the metric coincides with the standard near the equator. So these, these metrics were counterexamples to the so-called Minus conjecture. So it's a uh, kind of a negative result. So in, the, in some sense, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, is just to sort of look at, uh, try to prove positive results, right, in, in, in sort of like that direction. So this theorem sort of says that the positive mass theorem does not work in the spherical setting. It works in the Euclidean setting, the hyperbolic setting, but not, not for, the, for the sphere. So, um, so the question is, uh, okay, so the Minus conjecture is not true. But what can we do? What, what can we prove, right? What kind of rigidity is true? Can we, can, we, can we prove a rigidity statement for which the model is a round sphere? That's sort of the, the natural question. So there are, there are some results uh, which kind of do this. I should say that the Minus conjecture is true if you assume that the Ricci curvature is bounded by the standard one. So for, 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 for Ricci curvature, the rigidity statement is true. That was proved by Hang and Wang. 
It's a very nice and tricky application of the Bochner technique. So let me just mention this. Hang and Wang proved against 2009 that the hemisphere is rigid under the stronger condition that this rigid curvature is bounded by the standard rigid curvature. So you cannot increase this, the rigid curvature. Um, right. Let me mention another result. This is due to Ike Mayer. So this is, again, a rigidity result for which the model is a round sphere. So what he proved was the following. If you look, uh, if you have a metric on the sphere, so now we, we go to three dimensions. Right? If you have a metric on the three sphere, uh, and, and you suppose that the scalar curvature is at least the standard scalar curvature, which is 6, if the radius is 1. Uh, and he needs an excellent assumption that the rigid curvature is positive. So this sort of works in the neighborhood of the standard sphere. He proved that the maximum of the isoparametric profile uh, is always bounded by 4 pi, and equality achieves... If equality is achieved, then you are you are the round sphere. And equality, if and only if uh, G is round. So remember that the isoparametric profile is defined as the infimum of the area of surfaces which bound the volume V, right? So this is a rigidity result uh, in the context of isoparametric surfaces. Um, there's another result which is more related to what I'm going to talk about today, which is a rigidity result for which the model is the projective space, RP3. Again, for an area minimizing surface. So this is due to Bray, Brando, uh, Ike Mayer. Nevis. So they prove the following. Suppose you have a three manifold. Uh, suppose the scalar coverage is bounded by six. And suppose that there exists um, suppose that there exists a projective plane. Let me state it a little bit differently. Suppose you have a sigma which is an RP2 inside M, and suppose that it's area minimizing, then they prove that the area of such a projective plane is at, is at most 2 pi, and equality is achieved, again, if you are the round projective space, and equality, if and only if, uh, again, G, <coughs> your manifold is actually isometric to the standard projective space. So this, is, again, assumes area minimizing. So, of course, if you are working on the sphere, right, you cannot, you cannot hope to find area minimizing surfaces. The sphere does, for example, the standard sphere does not have any area minimizing surface. So uh, we wanted to, to consider the case of surfaces produced by min-max methods. So let me explain what we what we did. So before I state the theorems, I have to recall or introduce the definition of width. So given a, a three-dimensional manifold, right, it is known that by Mimax methods, one can prove that there's always an embedded minimal surface, compact minimal surface, minimal surface inside any given uh, uh, given three manifold. And that's related to the concept of width. So in this uh, talk, I'm going to restrict to the case of the round sphere because it's a little bit simpler to, to explain of the, what the width is. So the idea is the following. Um, so you look at the standard sphere, right? So you have a sphere containing a four. So let's say this is x4 axis. So there's a standard foliation of the sphere, which is given by the 
level sets of the coordinate function. So let's, let me denote this by sigma t bar. This is just a set of points where the height function is equal to t, where t goes from minus 1 to 1. Now what you do is you choose any one parameter family of diffeomorphisms. So Ft is a smooth uh, one parameter family of diffeomorphisms of this sphere of diffus of S3. Uh, you can require these diffeomorphisms to be isotopic to the identity, for example. And now you, you apply this family of diffeomorphisms to the standard family of surfaces that you have here. So what you do is that for each sigma t, uh, if you apply the diffeomorphism, you get this, what we call a sweep out. Maybe the surfaces intersect each other now because the diffeomorphism can depend on the surface. Right? So you define um, sigma t to be the image of sigma t bar under the diffeomorphism Ft. So sigma t is just Ft of sigma t bar. And this family of surfaces is what we call a uh, family of sweep out. So this sigma t is a sweep out of the sphere. So you have this class of, this class of sweep outs of spheres in S3. And then what you do is that if you start with any given metric on S3, for each sweep out like this, you, you look at the surface which has the largest area, right? And then after you do this, you minimize this area over all, over all sweep outs. So it's a mean max invariant, and that's the definition of the width. So the definition is the width of of the metric G is just the infimum over all sweepouts of the supremum of areas. Right. So you can prove that this is a positive number. And there is a whole uh, general theory which tells you that this number is actually achieved by uh, maybe disjoint union of of minimal surfaces. So let me summarize this here. So the general theory tells you that the, the width is achieved uh, by a disjoint union of minimal surfaces. With multiplicities, so the area here has to be counted with multiplicities. So, and that's how you prove that any. So, actually, this is for the sphere, right? But if you have, if you have a, 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 another a general compact three manifold, you can look at the level sets of a Morse function. Then again, you apply diffeomorphisms, do the mean max. You prove again that the width is achieved by minimal surfaces, and that's how you prove that any 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 manifold has a minimal surface. Any three manifold has some embedded minimal surface. So this is proved by Pitts in the early 80s. This work of Simon and Smith, and there's a very recent survey by uh, Coding and the Lillis. This is 2003, where they sort of give a complete account of this history, and they give complete proofs of all the results. Uh, I should say that for the applications that I'm going to uh, state in a minute, uh, we also need to control the genus, right? So you, you start with, uh, for example, here you start with spheres. You, sort of, you, you want the surface that you get in the end to be a sphere again. So we need genus bounds. So genus bounds, some genus bounds were proved by also recently by Delilis and, and Pellandini. I should say that this theory is not done. There, there are some conjectures about what should happen to the genus. 
and what should happen to the index of the surfaces. And these conjectures remain to be proved. So there's a sort of a gap in the theory of, of mean max minimal surfaces that still should be completed. So let me state the theorems then. And maybe say a few words about the proofs. So, so the first theorem says the following. Theorem one. So this theorem is again a, is our joint work with Andre Neves. The paper is, av is available in the archive. Uh, says the following. If you have a metric on the three sphere and scalar coverage is bounded by six, for this theorem, we actually need to assume that the Ricci coverage is positive, <coughs> as in the Eichmeier's result. So what we prove is the following. Um, there exists a minimal sphere sigma inside S3 of index 1. Remember that the index is the number of negative eigenvalues of the second variation operator. So there exists a minimal sphere of index 1 uh, such that it achieves the width. So the width is, is realized by by a single sphere, right, with, of index one. This area is less than or equal to four pi. And again, inequality holds if and only if it's the round metric. So equality, if the width is four pi, then g is round. Okay, so that's the, that's the first result. So it's a rigid statement. Um, where the surface involved is actually a Mimax minimal surface. Uh, and the second theorem, um, we drop the assumption of positive Ricci coverage in the second theorem, and we prove the following. If you have a metric, again, on the three sphere of scalar curvature bounded by six, so suppose that G is not round, right? suppose G is not round, Otherwise, we know everything, right? So if G is not round, then we can prove that then we can always find a minimal sphere of index. In this case, the index is less than or equal to 1. The, surf, the, the sphere could be stable, for example. It cannot be stable here because of the positive rich curvature assumption. Uh, of index less than or equal to 1, let's say sigma, such that the area of sigma is strictly less than 4 pi. So the strictly less here means that we have rigidity, right? Because the only exception here is the, the case where the, where the matrix is actually the standard sphere. But where the matrix is actually standard, then the area should be 4 pi here. So in all the, all, all the cases, we, we find a minimal sphere of area strictly less than 4 pi. So these theorems are somehow reminiscent of positive mass type results and also the Minus conjecture. So, uh, so those are the results. Maybe now I should. Um, let me mention that in both these theorems, the, the rigidity part of the statement is uh, proved by using Ricci flow. So that's an application of Ricci flow for the rigidest statement. Um, so let me mention that the connection between minimal surfaces, minimal surfaces, uh, and Ricci flow, right, is very interesting. So I guess Hamilton was the first one to consider the evolution of the area of minimal surfaces under Ricci flow. But there's, a, there's also a very nice work by Cody and Minikaze, which is kind of related to the width, where they prove that so they prove that the richer flow with surgery becomes extinct in, in, in finite time if, it, if the manifold is a homotopy sphere. And that proof uses uh, minimal surfaces, using the, uses the idea of width. So the idea is that uh, somehow they prove that the width has to go to zero in finite time. So the metric has to disappear before that. So also, again, these theorems are examples of this connection between minimal surfaces and richer flow. So let me say a few words about the proofs. I have 10 minutes left. 
So, yeah, so what's the idea of the, the proofs? So first, uh, there are very basic estimates which fall, uh, very basic estimates tell you that classical in theory tell you that if you have a, I'm always assuming that the scalar curvature is bounded by a six, right? So if you have a sphere, minimal sphere, and if this minimal sphere happens to be stable, then you can prove just by the inequality that I, that I wrote in the beginning of the talk that the area is at most four pi over three. And again, very classical. If the minimal sphere happens to be of index one, then it, which is the case for, for the round sphere, right? Then the area should be bounded by four pi. This is based on the so-called Hirsch trick or technique, which uses the uniformization theorem, right, to prove such, such a bound. So this is very classical. So what we have to do is to prove that uh, such a sphere exists, so such a sphere achieving the width. Once we know that it index one, it follows automatically that the area is bounded by four pi. And also the basic estimates tell us that the theorem two will follow from theorem one if we replace the assumption of positive Ricci curvature by the assumption that there are no stable minimal spheres. So if the Ricci curvature is positive, then it's very easy to see from the second variation formula that there cannot be a stable minimal sphere in there. So this assumption implies that. Uh, but if you prove this weaker version with that assumption instead of positive Ricci curvature, then theorem two falls, right? Because you have this metric. So uh, there are two possibilities. First one, there is a stable minimal sphere. If there is a stable minimal sphere, then we already know that the area will be bounded by four pi over three. So strictly less than four pi, right? If there are no stable minimal spheres, then you just use theorem one and produce a mean max sphere of area bounded by four pi. So, so with that assumption, let's say this is theorem one prime. And what I'm saying is that theorem one prime implies theorem two. So let me tell you the idea of theorem one prime. So the idea is the following. So you have this, so you have this metric on the three sphere, you know lower bound for the scalar curvature, and you know that there are no stable minimal spheres. So the first thing you do is that uh, Simon and Smith here had proved that you can always find at least one minimal sphere. So there is at least one minimal sphere inside such a manifold. So if you use compactness theorems due to uh, Michael Anderson and Brian White, one can prove that there is a minimal sphere of least area. Sigma null. So I'm just talking a little bit about the proof. There is a minimal sphere of least area. So this follows by, by some compactness theorems of Michael Anderson and, and Brian White. Uh, okay, so you look at this minimal sphere of least area, right? So let me make a, uh, let me, let me draw a picture here. Let's say this is sigma naught. Uh, then you know that there are no stable minimal spheres, right, by assumption. So therefore, the index of such a sphere, the index of sigma naught, has to be at least one. So you have at least one direction which decreases area and also increases mean curvature. So what you do is that the local picture is very similar to what happens in the standard sphere. If you look at the... Uh, you have to choose the first eigenfunction of the Jacobi operator. Let me just write down this here. So the Jacobi operator, remember, is given by this. Times C. So because the index is at least one, one knows that the first eigenvalue of such operator is negative. So you can find uh, the first eigen you look at the first eigenfunction of such an operator, so lambda one is negative. 
and the function can be chosen to be positive because it's the first eigenfunction. So if you flow the, the surface in the direction of phi times nu, what you get is that a surface here which has positive mean curvature pointing in that direction, just like in the standard sphere. So the same happens here. Mean curvature is pointing in that direction. So now, uh, in this side, we have some manifold width boundary. Let me call it N1. On the other side, I have this manifold width boundary N2, which is just a ball. This is just a ball because the manifold is a sphere. So now the idea is that uh, we, we run a mean max with boundary here. So let me draw the picture here. So the idea is now I look at all the sweep outs which go inside and, and coming from the boundary. So that's, we run, next step is to run a min max with boundary. And that works because the mean curvature is positive. The boundary serves as a barrier for that. So there are two possibilities. So we have this notion of width for manifolds with boundary. And the, the possibilities are the following. So the first one is that the uh, somehow the width could be bigger than the area of the boundary. Strictly bigger. Something like this, for example. Right? So here is the boundary of N1. Sorry. The boundary of N1 is here. But if that happens, if the, if the width is strictly bigger, then the Vmax produces a minimal surface inside. So you find a minimal surface here somewhere, minimal sphere, mean coverage is zero. And now this guy uh, is a barrier. So now what I can do is that I, I pick my original minimal surface and minimize area inside this region in between the two minimal surfaces. So you minimize area. You use mix Simon Yao. Minimize area in the isotopic class uh, in the in, inside. So this works as a barrier. So you produce a stable minimal surface somehow. Here. This guy's it's minimal and stable. But that's a contradiction, right? Because by assumption, we know that there are no stable minimal spheres inside. So that's, the picture is wrong. So this picture is wrong. The right picture is the following. So here is the boundary of N1, boundary of N2. So this cannot happen. So the width of N1 has to be equal to the boundary. So that means that you can sort of, you can foliate inside with surfaces of area strictly less than the area of the boundary. So, so the basic, the, the right picture is something like this. So you find a, a sweep out with, with area controlled. Right? And somehow here is the original sigma knot. So that's the right picture. And once, once we produce the sweep out, one can check that the index has to be exactly one. It cannot be two, for example. It cannot be two because if you had an extra direction which decreases area, you could sort of like perturb a little bit the sweep out and produce an even better sweep out. So the index has to be uh, exactly one and has to be equal to the, the width, has to be equal to the area of that uh, minimal sphere of least area, right? It has to be equal because, um, you know, first we produce a very good sweep out such that the maximum of the areas is exactly the area of sigma naught, right? So that already proves one side of the inequality. So it proves that the, the width is less than or equal to the area of sigma naught just because we constructed a very good sweep out. And on the other hand, the area of sigma naught has to be also less than or equal to the width because remember that the width produces minimal surfaces, right? But we know that the sigma naught is the minimal surface of least area. So we also have the other inequality. And from that follows that index is one. So let me just, uh, in two or three minutes, talk about the rigidity part of the theorem, maybe two minutes. So how, how does one prove rigidity? Well, the idea is that basically what we proved is that if there are no stable minimal spheres, then one can always realize the width by one single sphere of index one. And we know, the, we know a, a bound for the area. So the idea for the rigidity part is to use Ricci flow. 
because Richard flow which is given by this equation, is starting with your initial with the initial metric T, right? And because uh, again by compactness arguments, one can prove that at least for a small time for T between zero and epsilon, the manifold S three G of T again admits no stable minimal sphere. This is just a compactness argument, minimal sphere. So we know that for at least for a small time, the width of G of T will be achieved by a single sphere of index one. And uh, with that information, let me just write down the inequality. Once we know that, that the width of G of T is achieved by some surface sigma T of index one, it's a very standard calculation, which is actually due to Hamilton. So uh, he proves that if you differentiate the area, if you freeze one of those guys and let, and let the metric vary, right, you get minus 8 pi minus, this is just a calculation, something like this. And again, by the, by the Hirsch trick, Hirsch trick, you can bound this guy, and this is always bounded by minus 16 pi. So one can use this to prove that the width of G of T is actually bounded from below by the initial width minus uh, 16 pi T, at least for a small time. So to finish the argument, one just looks at the scalar curvature. So let me just finish the argument in this in a second. So we know, on the one hand, that the width satisfies this inequality just from a calculation. But we also know that the scalar curvature increases. So the scalar curvature obeys the following equation. So uh, this is always bounded. This is always bounded by the scalar curvature squared divided by three. So you prove by maximum principle that. The scalar curvature is always, if the scalar curvature starts at time zero bounded by six, then at time t will be bounded by six divided by one minus four t. This is just maximum principle. And that tells you that the width, again using our result, because you divided by one minus four t, the width should be multiplied by one minus four t. You get the other guy. So if it happens that the if you assume that you achieve equality, the initial width is actually full pi, you get that this is greater than or equal to that, but also less than or equal to that expression, so you actually get equality. So in the end, you prove equality. So in other words, you prove equality here, right? You prove equality in the end. So therefore, when I use maximum principle here, I'm dropping the traceless Richard tensor. So that implies that the metric is Einstein. And since it's Einstein in dimension three, it has constant curvature. So that's that's how the argument goes. Um, right. So we have uh, another result for for general manifolds, but I'm not, I, don't, I do not have time to state here. Uh, but uh, you know, there are a couple of things that we we can do. So I, 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 there's some interesting directions that you can find in the paper. Some maybe conjecture that we state here. And, and again, there's bounds on the index and the, and the genus, which should be done, right? There's this gap in the theory, which remains to be solved. So let me stop here. Thank you.